Hello everyone. Um, so just to start off, uh, this is still preliminary as it is part of my thesis and it's ongoing. Um, same thing as Rebecca, the first Rebecca. Um, any sort of comments would be very welcome. Um, so in 2014, the remains of an adult male, burial 243, were recovered from a metal period site in the Philippines. In the process of excavation, it became clear that burial 243 had suffered a severe and disabling injury to his right leg some months before his death. And this suggests that he is a suitable candidate for the bioarchaeology of care analysis. Okay, so the bioarchaeology of care approach is a case study of approach using four stages. It examines health related caregiving in the past, using evidence indicating that an individual survived a serious pathology for which that individual would have likely required care. The index of care, which is a web-based tool supporting the bioarchaeology of care analysis was used in this case study. So this presentation uh, defines disability as a state, temporary or longer term, arising from an impairment in body function or structure that is associated with activity limitations and or participation restrictions and given meaning in relation to the life ways in which it is experienced. Uh, I'll briefly describe the NAPA site before I discuss the process and the results of our bioarchaeology of care analysis. So NAPA site is situated in Kandawan City in southern Luzon in the Philippines. It is primarily a jar burial complex but there are also extended burials at the site. Um, the site is close to the ocean and the burials are overlaid by a shallow midden. So the sea is likely to have been an important part in terms of the source of food and involved in their life ways. Artifacts such as decorated pottery and carnelian beads and possibly Chinese glass beads suggest that potential trading practices connecting this site and other part, to other parts of the Philippines and further afield. So why study healthcare in the first place? Well, healthcare reflects a range of cultural values and behaviours that are often not accessible in archaeology, but through the analysis of treatment of received by an individual, someone who because of disability may not have been able to fully participate in their community and care reflects a conscious choice to provide for that person, this care may provide insights about the importance of the individual life in that society. Bioarchaeology of care analysis in this case study illustrates also how this technique can be applied to quite a complex socially stratified society revealed over the last 50 years of research in the Middle Period Philippines. And it also provides a method for inferring how well, we don't have historical documents available. So the index of care is a four-stage process, each step building on the previous one. From initial collection of information through addressing the functional and clinical impacts of disability, then inferring a model of care uh, based on these limitations, and then finally interpretation of the implications of care practice for understanding the relationships between the individual, the carer, and the community. So step one involves a description of the individual, their pathology, their life ways, their mortuary context. Um, Beryl 243 is a middle-aged individual who was, he's a male, who was buried in an extended supine position, head facing to the east and facing right. Right. It would appear that he was buried in a narrow grave, uh, a narrow grave cup, sorry, and his body may have been wrapped in some sort of shroud, shroud but I'm not quite sure. There are six extended burials at the site um, that have been discovered, and burial 243's treatment's relatively unique, with the exception of another burial that's been found also showing the signs of being buried in an enclosed burial space. Muscle markers suggest that burial 243 was involved in considerable levels of physical activity, uh, particularly to the upper body. 
He also experienced, unfortunately, uh, segmented two transverse fractures of the right femur, one of the proximal shaft and one of the mid shaft. And they were likely sustained at the same or a similar time and probably caused by a high level impact such as a fall. There's also an infection of um, infection of the proximal shaft. Um, there's cloacae present, and it's not sure whether that's actually a primary infection or whether that's a secondary infection, but it's quite likely to be chronic, so it did have significant effect. Um, we can't really say as to what that infection caused, whether it was involved in death or not. Uh, the right femur is in the process of healing, which is why this is quite important. The presence of trabecular bone and remodeling of the callus suggests that the fracture likely occurred a minimum of six months. The leg healed completely misaligned and rotated externally almost 90 degrees. It is shortened by 10.5 centimeters compared to the left. So, once again, significant damage. So, then there is also evidence for dislocation on the acetabulum, which suggests potential, dislica uh, potential dislocation of the femoral head and relationship between the rotated angle of the femoral head and markers for subluxation suggests that potentially uh, the fracture may have actually led to the dislocation of the acetabulum. So, in step two, uh, the parameters of the disability are defined, the clinical impacts, the physical effects of pathology are, also, are considered as well as the functional impacts which are the aspects of daily life that are affected. The overall muscular uh, damage is um, indicated on the slide. Uh, the femoral fractures would have immobilized burial 243 for a minimum of six weeks when load bearing may have been possible. The pain of the dislocation may have even lengthened this period. Barrel 243 would have likely have been immobilized again once infection set in at the end of his life as well. The proximal fracture and the dislocation is associated minimally with damage to the gluteal muscles and associated muscles of the upper limb. The mid shaft fracture is likely to have affected the adductor muscles, um, also suggested by myositis of uh, acidic hands on the adductor longus attachment, and also other associated fractures of the medial mid shaft. Severe blood loss resulting from the fractures and the dislocation is likely, but fracture location means that uh, damage to the major arteries and veins is less probable, and that's also similar for the femoral nerve and the sciatic nerve. So it is likely that motor innovation was unaffected. Towards the end of the individual's life, the infection did become more severe. It's not possible to infer whether the infection occurred following the trauma, but it became severe enough to impact bone in the weeks to lead into his death. At this point, the individual may have lost mobility, as I said, and um, although given the deformity, any sort of uh, healing word mobility that he regained during this time would have been severely restricted. Uh, oh, there's functional impacts. So burial 243's injuries would have affected his ability to provide himself with food, uh, manage basic bathing and toileting, uh, any uh, hygiene practices such as self-management of wounds, um, mobility in the domestic space or even in short distances. And perhaps repositioning of, the bo of his body would have been necessary when the pain was particularly bad. As an adult male, he would have typically have been involved in food production and other economic activities, and his bone healing may have been allowing him to continue then to contribute, at least impartially, back to the society in terms of tool or pottery production or shellfish processing as seen from the shell bin at the site. 
The individual may even be able to assist in fishing if he was placed in a boat. Uh, it's possible over time he regained some of his mobility, um, which would have allowed for even more of this. So these impacts would require a healthcare response and step three helps construct a model of likely care that burials with 43 received based on available resources, knowledge of the effects of the pathology itself and also their background medical knowledge. Here, care is considered in terms of direct care, where this is the physical intervention of healthcare, or in terms of accommodation, where expectations are adapted to allow an individual to be included in normal group and daily activities. Immediately following the trauma, acute care would have been needed to control for major blood loss and the cleaning of wounds, suggesting a particular level of medical knowledge in that community. Burial 243 would have needed food provided for him as well as water, even when he was mobile, because his mobility was essentially restricted. Similarly, toileting and bathing and cleaning any potential wounds associated with the injury or from tension of the skin following immobility was necessary. Provision of shade and shelter for rain and cold nights would have been necessary to maintain his health. And help with basic hygiene would have been particularly necessary during the time for mobility. And as I said before, he might have regained some independence as his bone healed. Um, perhaps to facilitate this mobility, if it happened at all, the individual may have had a crutch or a walking stick to allow him to walk around or move around the domestic space. But when the infection set in towards his life, assistance in providing ways to regulate his body temperature would have been essential. The pain associated with the worsening infection may have also resulted in disruptions to sleep and a level of general discomfort required but possibly others to help him deal with it. So step four, the interpretations. The social implications of providing care are analysed in this step. Uh, reasons for providing care are examined with the aim of engaging, of gaining insight into the individual and their society. Factors that may have influenced this decision include burial to 43's age and established role in the society, his muscle markers indicate physical labour, suggesting active involvement in group economic activity before his injury. Given the physical risks of hunting, fishing and farming, the community likely had prior experience of fracture treatment. Uh, once the fracture healed, any costs would have likely been seen as relatively low given the fact that the subject's upper body mobility nor intellect appear to have been compromised. We can hypothesise a relationship of trust and cooperation between Burial 243 and his carers during the period of immobilisation at the very least. Aspects of care at this stage, uh, stage such as bathing and toileting, they're really intimate. Uh, the psychological implications of this disability remain unknown, but sudden disability onset can be associated with depression, uh, particularly for an individual like Beryl 243 who was relatively mobile and physicality was something that was very second nature to that individual. The implications of mortuary treatment are normally also assessed in step four, but these remain relatively ambiguous um, because there is another individual who's buried similarly and pending analysis that might actually prove to be relatively interesting. So while it's not possible to identify whether care was withdrawn before burial 243's death, there's no reason to believe that it was. It can be inferred that the care continued close to the time of death as the infection that was possibly or potentially the cause of death or associated with it was severe enough to make a level of care necessary for extended survival. Burial 243's community made the choice to care for one of their members who suffered an injury significantly affecting his ability to contribute to the, the group economy. In turn, Burial 243 cooperated with this care. Examining the evidence of this inter uh, interaction provides us a way of looking more closely at the practices and the values of a past society. Thank you.
I may not have been paying attention. Did you um, talk about the estimated time period at which this has all happened? Well, estimation is minimum six months. That's as far as I can work out. I've done x-ray analysis, but didn't really show much. All right, so six months worth of care. And, and how long ago? Uh, so early mental age, so that's first millennium <coughs> AD. I actually, for my thesis, did some ethnographic um, material myself here, which I couldn't present here. Um, so yes, I did look into that. I'm yet to look into what other people have done. Um, what I did for my ethnographic research was to look um, at the modern society that Sarah had now, and so my questions were directed at the environmental conditions of living in such a place, not necessarily the cultural impacts, because obviously they're very different. Um, but I am yet to obviously step forward the interpretation phase. That's quite important in terms of understanding the reasons why people give care, um, especially when there's the knowledge that that care is not going to be reciprocated. That was a very interesting talk. Thank you. Um, two questions. First question is, um, was he buried with anything? And yeah. second question, um, what was his location in the site in reference to the boat burial or boat markers that Victor is saying? <laughs> He's curious. <laughs> okay, so he was buried with um, a few great goods. He was buried with shell and plain pottery. Um, Interesting, some of those shells are closely related to positions such as his femur. So there's, there's shells that have been placed, but whether that's just taphonomical, I don't know. Um, uh, as for his position in the site, it's up north in line the rest of the extended burials. Um, so it's north of the jar burials in locality one. Thank you.